Let's see what the stew has for us today. Welcome to the Gnomecast, a Gnome Stew's tabletop gaming advice podcast. Here we talk with the other gnomes about gaming things to avoid becoming part of the stew, so I guess we'd better be good. This episode is brought to you by our awesome Patreon backers like the courteous Craig Dedrick, the gracious Greg Gordon, and the jubilant Jim Anderson. Today we have myself, Ange, along with Senda, and today we're going to talk about interpersonal relationships of our characters, hopefully in such a way that it's helpful for everyone and not just the two of us talking about our characters for a whole episode. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Before we dive into that main topic, though, let's ask a get to know a gnome question. Senda, without getting too personal, mm-hmm. what's a time you had to deal with the fallout of a bad relationship between players in one of your game groups? Yeah, I've told a little bit of this story before on some other podcasts. And like, I can't imagine that I am alone in this sort of thing. My game group in college, inevitably, I started dating one of the guys, but like it turned all messy. And then he was dating my best friend who was also in the group. But I was really (laughs) disgruntled about that. And it was not a clean breakup. And uh, so, yeah, you know, you know. We didn't, we didn't end up finishing Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil. And I can't say it was entirely because of that situation, but that certainly slowed us down from playing literally overnight, at least (laughs) once a week to like, ah, playing for like four hours maybe and like slowly petering away through the discomfort of all sitting at a table together. It was a very bad idea for us to try and just pretend that nothing was happening. Was one of the three of you in that triangle the GM of the group? No, thankfully. Yeah, that poor GM. Yeah. (laughs) No matter how much they wanted to continue that campaign, they knew it was a losing battle. Yeah, 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 yeah. We made it through a lot up to that point, too. But yeah, the moment that there was like, messy breakups and then like immediately dating somebody else and like ah it was it was such a college drama moment like (laughs) you know when I tell it back it's more like oh my gosh it sounds like it's like the kind of thing that you would make up in a game about college (laughs) but it's like it was my real life anyway and (laughs) I'm actually going to skip my college gaming drama relationship story sure. and tell you about one that happened a few years ago. So 5th edition D&D had just come out, and my buddy Tristan, who's one of the regular GMs, wanted to run a game. And one of the other players, his partner, occasionally would game with us. And they really wanted one of their friends to experience gaming, because he was curious about it. And we figured, you know what? Tristan wants to try running 5e. Mm -hmm. And this guy wants to try D&D. We'll run this one shot out of the starter box. Sure, yeah. So we can all get a taste of what the system is like and introduce this guy to D&D. As it turned out, we didn't finish in one session. Yeah, I I also tried to play that one shot and also did not finish. Yeah, it's it's not a one shot. No. (laughs) We... We, we ended up back at his house for the second shot. And now, mind you, I didn't like this guy. I didn't like this new guy. He he set off all my creep vibes. I really didn't like... We had to play in his house because his husband wouldn't allow him to go to anybody else's house, which was a whole other that creep is a, factor. A whole other... Wow. Yeah. So, but I was like, this is this is a short-term thing. We'll, we'll just do make do. Yep. And then at the end of that second session where we wrapped up the scenario, the, I'll call this person C, Mm -hmm. um, the partner of my friend who was a regular member of the group who occasionally played with us. C invited this new guy that none of us liked to become a regular player in our game without talking to any of us. Uh, While not being a regular player themselves? No, I mean, they, they had, they went through intermittent spurts where they would play for a year at a time and then disappear for a year at a time. Right. And they were in one of their, their regular playing spurts and they, and C invited this guy to play with us. And I was like, me being me was the only one who vocally said, no, that's not how this works. You talk to the group first before you invite anybody into a campaign. And I'm saying this all right in front of this guy. Right. (laughs) 
I mean, which is fair because that is not how it works. Yeah, that is not how it works. And I will say that incident ended up leading to C no longer ever playing with our group again. And the creepy new guy also not playing with our group. But I was actually worried for a little while that I might have killed my friendship with C's partner because of that situation. And he is somebody I did not want to lose as a friend. But thankfully, it has all worked out in the end. Tricky, tricky. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If, If there's a lesson to be learned from that, it's like, you could probably be a little more diplomatic than I was, but you still have to stand up for, you know, the cohesion of your group, especially if you have a solid group of players that you regularly play with. You can't just add a new person without oh, changing yeah. the dynamic of everything. Yeah, it's something um, not to go off too much of a rabbit hole, but I think I can't remember if I actually wrote these articles or just thought I was going to write these articles or started to write the series and didn't finish writing the series. I know I wrote at least one article about how changing your group changes the group dynamic because it, it like it does. And it's like, I really does, you know, and now that I have a solid group that I really like to play with, I kind of like, I do a lot to protect that dynamic right like i'm like no this is the people like there's there's one person who fades out in and out a little bit who works when he's there and it's fine when he leaves and like other than that i'm pretty much at a point where i'm like no this is this is now set right Mm -hmm. like now we don't now we don't mess with it anymore we we tootled around with some other stuff and like no now now i'm just like no no we got this it's done we we actually split my regular group into two groups because we had two people move into the area that wanted to play and we wanted to play with. Right. But we also didn't want to play with an eight person group. Too many people. It's too many people. You know, yeah. so we also like some some members of the group were able to play every week yeah. and other people were only able to play every other week. So we just split them in two. And so now I have a game every week with just a slightly different group each time. Nice. <laughs> nice. So getting into our main topic. Anyway, yes, moving right along. Yeah, like, <laughs> we actually have a topic here. Yes. As much as I love the exciting adventures and combats we have in role-playing games, oftentimes the parts that stick with me the most are my character's relationships with the other characters in the game. No matter how exciting the game's plot is, if I don't develop a connection with the other characters, that game's going to fade from memory. And I'm pretty sure Senda is very similar and into the interpersonal relationships of RPG characters. Am I wrong? (laughs) No, not at all. So I figured we could talk about this for a while. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Probably (laughs) for too long. It's fine. (laughs) It's fine. Where where do you want to start? (laughs) uh, Well, I'm going to say up front for for anyone tuning into this who's like, oh, God, they're going to talk about romance for a half an hour. No, relationships are more than just romance. Relationships... And and honestly, if you only think of romance when you think of relationship, I feel sorry for your friends because mm-hmm. yeah, there is way more to the term relationship than romance. Yes, yeah, yeah. But but we could start with romance. <laughs> now that you said it, I mean, we don't have to. I'm 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 thinking about like um, I I mean I I. Oof. Like part of what's interesting about this topic is sitting down and being like, which things do you even call out? Yeah. But maybe, and and I'm sneaking ahead because I'm peeking at your notes. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the first thing that we should actually talk about is that forming relationships PC to PC requires a certain level of vulnerability, I think, as a Mm -hmm. player, right? Because to be vulnerable as a character, you have to be a certain level of vulnerable as a player to kind of yeah. allow that bleed feel to happen, really, right? Because the, 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 emotions, the emotions, even if they're pretend, are still going to feel at least a little bit real. Yeah, or at least what, what I should say about that is when they still feel real is what I one of the things that I personally really enjoy about it, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, 
leaning into the relationships, I do it because I like to get that like sort of tangential emotional feel. And, you know, we could dive deep on psychology of why that is. I don't know. I mean, um, I have some theories like practicing emotions, practicing relationships in a safe space where like there aren't any mm-hmm. like real consequences. I mean, there, there are definitely real life consequences for being an asshole to other players at your table. But for right. your characters to interact, like, right, like you can create a scenario in which if you have social anxiety, you can try and experiment and practice with having feelings with other people in a way that is much more safe because they're not necessarily your feelings. <laughs> right. Like, there's-, there's one theory of, of, of why, but of course, I don't think that that necessarily addresses everything. But I don't know. I, I The thing that makes it tick for me is being able to have that level of immersive emotional play which sometimes for me means like high drama but sometimes Mm -hmm. it doesn't right like I usually end up talking about high drama just because it's really memorable (laughs) but that doesn't mean that's the only kind of relationship that I play in fact now this is romance like I said we may end up on romance a little bit but there was one game that I played where and, and and it was still a pretty high drama game but the drama wasn't the relationship. Like the wonderful thing about playing with people that I've been playing with for a long time is that we have a lot of trust already mm-hmm. built up. So it's easy to be vulnerable with people and create relationships that um, have strong attachments and, and or strong attachments and strong pulls away, right? Because you can, you can pull on that trust, lean on that trust that you can be vulnerable with those people. And also that it's okay for you to say if something is not okay and that they will tell you if something is not okay. Right. Like that's that's part of the trust, the the trust, the circle of trust too, right? Like you have to be confident that someone is going to tell you if something is not okay and you have to feel safe to tell them if it's not okay. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was I actually talking about? Right. (laughs) So having played a lot of games where there was high relationship drama a lot of love triangles in my past, <laughs> a lot of them. And don't get me wrong, I love them a lot and I'm not going to stop playing them, but approached this game and um, and and ended up, and it was actually when that I was playing. <laughs> there were more people involved <laughs> in the game, but when was the other person involved in this relationship with me? We talked about having a relationship and then we talked about like, we had already recently done some like, high drama love triangle will they won't they right so we're like let's we don't want to heard about your tales from the loop game. yes yes exactly oh my god it was so good though um (laughs) so we didn't want to do a will they won't they romance anymore so what we ended up doing was like no it's not a will they won't they they will they are fated to the problem is that they're like star-crossed right like It is their fate. They are soul connected. You know, they are meant for each other forever. But she's a monster hunter and he's a monster. So, like, (laughs) okay, well, I'm sure this will be complicated still, right? Like, (laughs) but then the drama wasn't from the relationship, it was from the circumstances, you know, around it, is what I was kind of getting to. um, I think. I don't know. I lost my train of thought because I had fun getting there. You know, I'll I'll bring it back to, to a point. You mentioned when. And I know when was the other player in your your very dramatic, wonderful yeah. romance in Tales from the Loop. He was one of the other players. Because there were two, you know, two people involved. But you are, you are good friends with Wen. You have a really good connection with him. And you know that you can go these places with him as another player in that relationship. You have that trust that lets you, you know, kind of explore that. Yeah. You know, and I, that's important. A, you, a is really important. Um, and I think that's, that's because of the vulnerability part. Mm-hmm. And B, and I'm, so I'm thinking, I'm, 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 I'm thinking a little bit of this, about this, how, as we're going into this. But one of the other things, you know, we talk about in gaming, doing a session zero and using that as a space to set expectations for your game. But when you are talking about creating a relationship between characters, part of that is actual just straight up negotiation between two players 
about what works for both of them, right? Mm -hmm. Which again, requires vulnerability and trust that you're communicating well and both saying what you mean and what you actually feel. I very often in, in my home game groups, I very often end up having my character connected to my friend, Chris. Yeah. We've never done, we've never done romantic relationships, but you know, we've started the game as our characters, our best friend. Right. We've started the game as our characters, our twin brother and sister. Yes. You know, like we've, we've established these things because we know that we enjoy playing off of one another mm -hmm. and whatever that relationship is, it can, you know, it It'll can blossom. add spark to the game. Yeah. And even in the game where we didn't start with our characters as, you know, having any sort of connection, in our very long running 5e campaign, it's like both of our characters would kill for the other character if we had to. Yeah. You know, it's like they have established. Yeah. I mean, the whole group has kind of established that bond. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, you know, that's through the course of many years of play. Yeah. Which you don't always have the opportunity to do. Yes. But when you do have it, it's, it's really nice. It's pretty great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have to admit, and, and so let me actually ask you a question, and mm -hmm. it's totally fine if the answer is both, but do you have a preference about setting up relationships in advance versus letting them grow organically through play? As a GM, I like to set them up at the beginning, or at least I like to encourage setting them up at the beginning. I This is actually a skill as a GM I have worked on developing because it's you know, very early in the days of, as I was getting more and more comfortable GMing and trying different games, I experienced, you know, Monster of the Week. Yeah. Where you set up connections between the characters. I love that because that created some really dynamic stuff for some short one-shot games. And I started bringing that into more games. And I've had a few bad experiences where, where you know, like I tried running a Firefly game where I did this, but None of the players really took it seriously. And by the time we started playing, like that, speaking, speaking of real life connections that nearly go boom in a game, uh, I had two people nearly destroy their friendship in the game because of the way one of the characters was acting to the other character. Yikes. And I was just like, okay, this is, this game did not go the way I wanted it to, but I've kept working at it and trying to develop you know, it's it's that balancing act between doing enough to give the players something to hook onto and actually interact with the other players with some deeper level connections to, you know, to start with that they can build on, but also giving them enough room so that the game can grow organically. I'll put this out there, right out there. One of my players, he is not asexual at all. As a person, as a human being, he is as far from asexual as you can get. But almost every single character he brings to the table comes across as ace, like completely disinterested, you know, in any sort of uh, sexual relationship, romantic relationship, anything like that. And I've had to, as a GM, when he's in my games, I've had to tread carefully because like I said, I'm all about the relationships. I want to push that shit. Uh -huh. I think that's okay to say. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's like he has no interest in it. And we had one game where his boyfriend at the time decided that his their two characters had been in a long-term, you know, a long-term casual relationship. Yeah. And like... And the, 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 the younger boyfriend that brought this up, like played into it every chance he get the older player who plays all his characters as very ace completely ignored it. Mm. Like was just like, I am not responding to this. I am not, I'm not acknowledging this, but it's like, I've had to, you have to, you have to know which players are going to enjoy diving into this stuff and which players you just need to let them have their own room to grow. Yeah. That's fair. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's interesting. I really like going into a game with, you know, at least one or two kind mm -hmm. of strong relationship bonds because I feel like it removes a lot of the like 
Hello, I am an elf, and you look like a strong person. <laughs> Let us go to the dungeon together, because we will split the money, and that is currently our only bond. You know, like, there's just, like, some level of awkwardness, because meeting new people in person is awkward, and then it's, like, even more awkward when you pretend pe people right. pretend meeting for the first time. Like, uh... <laughs> it makes it hard to go in and act as a unit, so, like, I, I like having something, but I also know that it's much easier for me to quickly engage in the game if I have a relationship dynamic that I can immediately latch onto. And it's really mm -hmm. funny because what always happens with me and Andy, and you can hear this in so many episodes of She's a Super Geek, and I don't know why. I think it's because we're basically like, I don't know, we're basically doing the adult sister thing, right? Like, and have been for a while. But like, we have a pattern that we fall into with our characters, which is they <laughs> always care about each other a bunch, but they also bicker a lot. Like, <laughs> and that's just like, they're always like these like good longtime friends who just like constantly are picking at each other. But for some reason, like, but having that relationship and a relationship style to um, sort of jump into with characters, it makes it really easy for us to find a pattern and a banter that you know those people would have with each other having known each other for a long right. time right and so it's, it's really interesting i don't know why that's the one i mean we've totally absolutely done other things too but like if we plan nothing in advance and we just start playing that's what happens <laughs> yep Yep, that's what you fall into. Right. And it's interesting because that's like the um sometimes what you when you played with people a bunch of times there's like specific tropes that you start sort of drifting towards and it's like it's like a Ouija board like once it starts going to a place you all just kind of go together and then you land at the place. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So like that's that's an interesting one to me, but like most of the time I really do like having a pretty good idea going in and probably that's partially because i like messy relationships <laughs> like we played cartel that was awesome and the next game we're probably gonna play we're gonna do session zero for um next week is monster hearts 2 which i'm very excited about <laughs> um it's gonna be great with this crew like <laughs> it can't not be this is the group that brought us that wild tales from the loop game and I can't wait. You know, I was about to say I I I'm not I'm not into messy relationships mm -hmm. in games as much. And then I'm sitting there thinking about the characters I've crafted for some of my one shots. Uh huh. And I'm like, you're a liar, Ange. Yeah. You may not necessarily like playing in a game as a mess with within a messy relationship, but you love being the GM presenting your players <laughs> with a messy relationship. Like in in a supernatural game, I ran quite a few years ago. I set up two characters. They were married. They were separated. She, on her sheet, it explained exactly why she left him. On his sheet, it said, you guys had an argument and she left and you're not sure why. Oh my. <laughs> and like, I loved so much seeing players just bring that to the table. Yeah, I would you absolutely know, like, pick up one of those. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I've, I've done, I've got a D and D game I've run as a one shot where two of the characters are, I guess you could call them star cross lovers. They were together. They separated because of circumstances and now they're sent on this adventure and they have to decide. They're still you know, in love, but they'll get exiled or whatever if they, yeah, yeah it's, whatever it it's is. One of them, one of them is the, 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 the crown prince who is supposed to inherit the kingdom. The other is his lover that shouldn't be his lover because there's political shenanigans going on and daughter of our sworn enemy <laughs> yeah you know so it's like you know there's this going on and they're just like you know and i love the added the added aspect to that is they're they're two male characters so it's a queer relationship beautiful and i brought that to the table not you know, like, I'm going to do this. And then I got it to the table and I'm panicking like, oh God, what if I end up with a table full of grognards? Oh God, what's going to happen? Right. And the very first time I ran it for strangers at a con, I had four guys sit down who were all part of the same group and two other people sit down. And the four guys pick characters and one of them is reading his background and all of a sudden he's like, who's playing so-and-so? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And one of his buddies, he's like, I'm playing. So have you read your background? No. Read your background. It's important. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh God, God, is this going to go okay. sideways? It was going to go sideways. No, no. By the end of the game, these two... These two dude bros were totally invested <laughs> in making sure that their characters ended up together. Oh, the best. That's I'm like, favorite. this is awesome. Oh, yeah, that's delightful. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing that I actually like. It's actually really interesting. Speaking of con games, when I sit down at a con game, if there are pregens on the table, everything that you're describing is what I actually look for on the sheet, mm -hmm. right? I'm like, who has a relationship or personality trait that I can latch on to to play this really fast and loose. I think it probably helps that for my current crew, we pass around the GMing seat a lot and we basically mm -hmm. play short campaigns, right? So we don't play, you know, we're not investing in like three-year campaigns. So it's perfectly reasonable for me to create a super messy relationship that may have a really tragic ending that we will line up with the ending <laughs> of that little campaign. And it's fine to just like lean all the way in on that because, you know, we're only going to play it for like five or six sessions, right? Which is a mm -hmm. very different prospect than I'm going to play this every week for three years. Like right. that might get difficult to maintain and to like continue to lean into with the same energy. Like I think that has something to do with why messy relationship stuff is working really well for me right now is also because of the style of gaming that I am doing lends itself to that really well. I don't know. It's really interesting, but like I've also had some really fun, you know, other relationships. Like I had a, had a wild, like I was a teenager being raised by my uncle because my parents disappeared beyond the gate that is broken and legendary and no one is allowed to go into. And like the whole ship disappeared behind that. And then when the ship came back, it was like a hundred years later and they weren't there. And it was just baby me and my uncle Jay, who was an addict of pretty much everything that you could be addicted to in this particular <laughs> world. Right. So like we had a really weird relationship, <laughs> but it was also like, he was also literally the only parent figure that my character had ever known. And she'd never lived on a planet or anything. She, like, was born and raised on this ship with this really wild, like, PTSD addiction adult figure as her, like, caregiver. <laughs> um, that actually sounds fantastically interesting. It was pretty great. It was pretty great all around. That game was wild. And um, it was definitely... The game in which we broke scum and villainy by accidentally playing a storyline that did not work for those mechanics in any way, shape, or form <laughs> at all. And so we kind of just kept going anyway because that's who we are. But um, uh, it was good to see, like, I still have feels about that game, too, because with yeah. that game, like, um, that was, that was sort of the key relationship for me in that game. This, this actually make, reminds me of a bad experience I had with a parental relationship inside a game. Oh, dear. And I, what, what I want to caution people is you always want to make sure that the relationship is encouraging play and not stopping play. Yes. I played a one shot where I was playing like a kid, 10, 12, something like that. Yep. And one of the other players was playing my mother. Uh-huh. And she spent the entire game being in character and protecting her child and not allowing me as a player to do anything. anything. Woof. And, that's, you know, the, that's, you know, not, not to put, not to put any on a, you know, not to put any, uh, you know, blame on the GM, but he didn't know how to handle this. Yeah. So he would have me roll to try and sneak off. And she would roll better, so it would kill whatever I was trying to do. And just the entire game was no fun because I never got to do anything. Yeah. But she was one of those players that was like, she was acting. She was playing her character. This mother would never let any harm come to her child. And I'm like, that's great, but I'm not having any fun 
in this game. I think there's a really key, it's a key thing, not just in that kind of situation, but also in the kind of situations where like, hi, I also played a Kender in a game for two years, right? So like (laughs) from the full opposite perspective of like playing the obnoxious character, I think that even when you are really strongly committed to a role, you have to be on some level aware of the table itself and the people around you. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you have to be able to distinguish as a player when your actions are causing issues for the people at the table versus what your character would do. And then your secondary responsibility, then once you've seen that as a player for making those relationships work at the table is finding a way to still be for that character to still be that character in that relationship. Right. But story-wise, you as a player, not as the character, need to find the way to allow the actual action to still happen around that relationship, right? In in a similar example, um, I played in a Firefly game with the canon characters. I played River. Yeah. Uh, another person I knew played Simon. Simon obviously wants to protect River and keep River from trouble. And River is one of those characters who could qualify as a Kender because if you play her badly, she can ruin the game for everyone else. Yeah, she is um, She is chaos. She is chaos. Yeah. But me, you know, like, I understood that, so I knew how to play her to stay true to the character without breaking the game and ruining it for everyone else. And the person playing Simon new to basically like how to role play being protective of river but also how to turn his back just enough so that river could wander away and do the thing right right because you like know? that's one of those like at a meta level there's no way that he's watching at every single second right exactly there's just no way that he and is stays true to the relationship yeah. between those two characters yes without denying anyone at the table fun right or or honestly what we're really talking about is agency, right? Yes. To just make a yes. choice and do something. So I think let's let's like bring an actual point out of this part of the conversation, which I think is that the relationships that you involve your character in, no matter how messy or how strong or how protective they are, should never at a table level prevent another player from having agency in their decisions about what, what their character is doing. Yes. Right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I think we've covered a lot and we've talked for a while. Yeah, I'm like so... I I feel like that's sort of a good point to wrap it up on I because mean, relationships I could definitely go for agency. another half an hour, but Rob would kill us. <laughs> we'll just at that point we really will just start describing wild relationships and they're just like, and there was this one time. I and... would t- I will tell you the details of how all of the tales from the loop one shot characters are connected oh. and tell you how people have played them. And like, that is no, we delightful. Don't need to go down okay, yes, all. but also there was this one time that my fiance turned out to be a praying mantis alien. <laughs> <laughs> and after he cut my father in half with his mandibles, I had to tell him that I was calling off the wedding. So it, you know. I love the stories of your games. <laughs> so. This show is funded by the Gnome Stew Patreon. You too can become a Patreon backer by following the Patreon link on the Gnome Stew website to the Gnome Stew Patreon. This ad is brought to you by Plunder. Is your player character looking for a quick hookup with other adventurers for some dungeon delving? Mm -hmm. Well, you should install Plunder, sure to match you with your dream barbarian. Swipe left, swipe right, swipe anything that isn't nailed down with Plunder. If you're enjoying the Gnome Cast, you'll probably like many of the other Misdirected Mark shows. Senda, can you tell us about this one to look out for? Oh boy, I, I don't know. This one sounds pretty great. Uh, have you heard of it before? It's called. I don't know. I've never heard of it before. <laughs> it's called Pandas Talking Games. And on it, Phil and Senda answer your questions about RPGs from the perspective of one shots and campaigns with some panda silliness. If you listen to it, you will love it, or so the rumors say. I feel like we also need to update that because I don't feel like one shots versus campaigns is truly accurate anymore. Yeah. But if you want to hear gaming questions 
that you ask us addressed from multiple points, multiple being two in this case, because there are two of us, <laughs> from two distinct points of view. Sometimes it's one shots and campaigns and sometimes it's GMs and players and sometimes it's, you know, I don't know, other things that also apply. Then that is what we do. And then it's, it, it's definitely, you know, you'll love it if you listen to it. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. <laughs> if, you, if you like the gnome cast, you will like Pandas Talking <laughs> Games. Go listen. Right, good. <laughs> so you can find all of us at gnomestew.com, at gnomestew on Twitter, and gnomestew on Facebook. Senda, where else can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me on Twitter. It's at Idella Mithland, I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D. And on uh, at Pandas Talk Games, if you want to find Pandas Talking Games instead, because <laughs> that's spellable. Um, and of course, I write articles on the stew. And um, you can also catch me in the Misdirect Mark forums. And you can catch me on the Tiki Talkies, if you can spell my name, because it's the same as Twitter. <laughs> You actually, you went ahead and used the same handle on TikTok, even though TikTok is brand new. I'm committed. I'm just committed. I was like, I'm not going to make it different now. Like, <laughs> then people will have to remember multiple things. If I'm going to be unspellable, I'm going to be unspellable for forever. So no, it's exactly the same on TikTok. Um, <laughs> I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D. Okay, cool. Anyway, Ange, where can people find you on the internet? <laughs> You can find me on Instagram and Twitter as Orikes13, O-R-I-K-E-S-13. See, they're the same, though, Ange. Yeah, they're the same. See how you they did that? <laughs> but it's shorter. But you still have to spell it. <laughs> I do have to spell it, because if I say Orikes, nobody knows what I'm saying. They look at it and they go, Orikes? What's that? <laughs> or they go, how do you spell Orikes? Orikes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Keep going. Anyway, I think we're done here. Do you think we avoided? Is our friendship strong enough that we avoided the stew? Ooh, if it's about friendship, then yes. If it's about content, probably. 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 Maybe. We, we talked. <laughs> we talked. About gaming. About relationships. In our relationships at some point. <laughs> Gnomecast is hosted by Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Today we have myself along my